Uh, thanks for the warm welcome, that's great. Um, welcome to Burning Down the House, a quick guide on how you can burn down your data center and hopefully put it all back again. Uh, so more specifically, we're going to be talking about uh, Backup and Restore of Cloud Foundry. Uh, I'm Henry. I'm Therese. Uh, we work on the Backup and Restore team uh, at Pivotal. Uh, and in this talk, we're going to cover the current approaches to backing up Cloud Foundry, what we've found people currently do, uh, the, the problems with those approaches, our solution to Backup and Restore, and then what the future of Backup and Restore of, of Cloud Foundry and Bosch releases looks like. So why bother backing up Cloud Foundry at all? It seems like a reasonable question to ask. Well, one of the first things we find operators tend to do uh, when they become uh, customers, when they start to use Cloud Foundry, uh, is ask about disaster recovery, ask about Backup and Restore. Because if you're, a, if you're running your mission critical apps on Cloud Foundry, then you need to have a very reliable way of backing up and restoring your CF. Um, fundamentally, we think that every company is a software company. Uh, and if you're running your mission critical workloads on it, you, know, you need to be able to recover not just your foundation, but your apps, uh, your data services, and everything around it. Um, and we also find a lot of organizations use Cloud Foundry in their dev workflows. So if your Cloud Controller API is offline, even for half an hour, that means that your developers, who are very expensive, are unable to push their apps. Your CI, CD pipelines aren't working. So what kind of things can go wrong with Cloud Foundry? Um, the sort of first set of issues we'll look at are like data corruption kind of problems, where you might want to roll back. So that might be a, a failed upgrade of your, of your Cloud Foundry deployment. Um, user error, like um, a few months ago, uh, GitLab sysadmin running, uh, dropping the wrong database uh, and finding the backups are all empty. Uh, or security issues. So uh, more and more we're seeing ransomware as a, an attack vector. Um, and the easiest way to get back from a ransomware attack uh, is simply to repave your entire deployment uh, and just roll back using a backup. Uh, and then there are like more serious failures, kind of hardware failures. So this is your, your storage attached network uh, dies or your data center fails, i.e. it floods. Uh, and we consider these last ones, these hardware failures, um, kind of a superset of all the rest. So that's what we're focusing on and what we focused on in this project. Um, so what does it actually mean to back up Cloud Foundry? Um, it's a complex distributed system. Uh, what do I need to take out of it so that I can put that information back into a new deployment and have it all just work? Um, so that really begs the question, where does the state in Cloud Foundry live? So if you imagine um, Cloud Foundry as having just these two components. So this is just a, just a slice of Cloud Foundry. We're looking at the Cloud Controller uh, and the Diego subsystem. So a Diego brain, some number of Diego cells. Um, this segment of Cloud Foundry, this view of it requires two data stores to function. Uh, you've got a relational database of some sorts. It could be an internal MySQL. It could be an external service that you connect to remotely. Uh, and a blob store, just like a flat file store. So that could be uh, S3. It could be an internal NFS blob store, uh, whatever you like. And these are the, the sort of the canonical places that Cloud Foundry stores state. So if we have a, a CF user, they CF push their app, the Spring app here. They push their app bits to the Cloud Controller, which will save some metadata down to the database about that app, and then save the app source into the Blob Store. Um, next, Diego sees that it needs to run an app. It receives a request for a long-running process. Uh, it pulls up the build packs and the app source, uh, and runs the, uh, stages the app. So it essentially compiles it into a droplet. And then once you have your droplet, uh, which is then uh, saved, details are saved into the database, and the droplet itself is saved to the blob store, then Diego can run it. So it pulls the app up and then stages it. So if we want to back up and restore Cloud Foundry in a consistent way, we need to make sure that we have both of these data stores. And we have to make sure we take the backup from them at exactly the same time or in some consistent way. Because if your database points to a compiled droplet that's actually not in the blob store, Diego's going to try and start that app up and find that it's missing, it's missing the droplet and can't run it. Um, and uh, crucial to this process is the fact that Diego is an eventually consistent system. So if you take this state, put it in a fresh Cloud Foundry that has no apps running in it, Diego will see, oh, I meant to have a whole bunch of apps running, and it will begin to, begin to spin them up uh, very quickly. Uh, obviously, Cloud Foundry is more complex than this. It has a whole lot of other components. Um, some are stateful, most are stateless, uh, and will just converge on the desired state. Um, the only one I've not mentioned is the UADB, which has user auth information. So that's the state in Cloud Foundry, but what about Cloud Foundry itself? What about the, the VMs, the actual software running on those boxes? 
we need to go deeper. So, as I'm sure you all know, Cloud Foundry is deployed on a control plane provided by Bosch, and Bosch is responsible for deploying the Cloud Foundry VMs. Uh, and, and Bosch actually looks quite similar in some ways. So you have a, the Bosch director, and then you have a relational database and a blob store. Um, so if you're an operator, you want to deploy something on Bosch, uh, like a Cloud Foundry, first you upload your release to Bosch, which is just the, the app, the release source, essentially. It saves metadata about that release in the database, and then saves the, uh, the entire release in the blob store. Then you deploy. Uh, your deployment manif manifest gets saved down, and then it gets retrieved along with release information, and then Bosch will compile your release. It will get, sorry, will pull the release bits up from the blob store and compile your release for your desired architecture. Then it'll deploy your VM. Bosch also then saves down the compiled release to your uh, blob store for uh, faster redeploys later on. So again, we see a very similar picture. If we want to take a backup of a Bosch director, we need to make sure we have both of these data stores, and they need to be in sync. It's no good having um, blobs in the blob store without any records referring to them in the database, because your deploys are going to fail. Um, Bosch is also an eventually consistent system. So if you uh, put all this data back into a Bosch director, it should stand everything up again. Um, although Bosch has a, um, the resurrect has a meltdown threshold, some of you may have seen, at which point it just gives up if it thinks something too catastrophic has gone wrong. Um, so this is sort of what the picture looks like. But there's also actually more complexity because you also have data services. So you have your Bosch director and your Cloud Foundry and your data services, all of which need to be backed up, and probably all of which need referential integrity between each other. So actually backing all, all these things up in a consistent way is, is quite tricky. So when we started with Backup and Restore, we looked at what existing companies are doing. Um, because companies ha aren't just doing nothing, uh, they all have their own solutions, like often hand-rolled. Uh, so the first one, uh, and potentially the most common, are tools that reach under the hood, so to speak. So these are um, often binaries or scripts that know a lot about Cloud Foundry, and they know that this version of Cloud Foundry runs this version of MySQL internally, and therefore needs that particular version of MySQL dump, and will just reach into the appropriate VM, run a MySQL dump, pull the data out. Um, so I mean, these all work, which is great, but they're very fragile. Uh, as soon as anything in Cloud Foundry changes, as soon as that version of MySQL changes, then your version of MySQL restore is just not going to work. So you end up with a tool that has a lot of knowledge about Cloud Foundry. Um, and you end up uh, having to maintain that tool and yourself needing a lot of knowledge about Cloud Foundry. Uh, backwards compatibility is a problem. Um, if those versions change, then you need to have, uh, you have, to, uh, have to have additional migration layers on top so that you can restore to, say, a newer version of CF. Uh, and consistency is, is not fixed by this, right? You still might end up with a backup of your blob store taken um, a few seconds before your backup of your MySQL, for example, and those records are then in inconsistent. Uh, some companies do replication. So uh, active-active uh, is just where you have two foundations, and active-passive is where you have two, but one is in a, a passive, kind of hot standby failover mode. Um, and again, this works really well, but is is very difficult to get right. Um, speaking to someone on the CloudOps EU team uh, has found that you often end up with a lot of sort of cruft in your IaaS layer because uh, when something goes wrong, uh, operators will tend to uh, just rapidly jump on and try and fix things uh, and maybe not do quite the right thing in the heat of the moment, and you end up with like bits of state that shouldn't really be there. Um, it obviously it doubles your cost. If you have a 50-cell uh, uh, foundation, then you're going to need to now run 100 cells at least. Uh, and it doesn't mitigate against malware. It's not really a backup at all, because if you push some user pushes a, a privileged app that's malicious, then it could damage your foundation, and then both are damaged by it. Uh, we also looked at snapshotting. Uh, so IaaS level uh, snapshots are, are these um, sort of IaaS primitives where you can just ask your IaaS to take a back of a disk. Uh, and it's quite nice because the, the VM itself doesn't know anything about it. So it just happens kind of out of band. Um, but that's also kind of a weakness as well because if the VM doesn't know a snapshot's being taken, then you might find that data is not being flushed to disk. So you have your Redis uh, VM that has lots of um, stuff happening in RAM, you take a snapshot, you effectively just pull the disk out from underneath the VM. All that data that was in RAM hasn't been saved down because it didn't know it was about to be backed up. Um, also, you don't need all that state. You know, if I'm backing up a Redis machine, I want the Redis RDB file. I don't want Redis itself, uh, all the logs, the whole OS. All this stuff is just is cruft and I have to store it. Um, it's also very slow for some IaaS, uh, and you still have problems with consistency. Another option uh, is just like do nothing. Allow it all to burn down. 
if you script your CF deployment in the first place, well then if everything does fall over, you can just bring it back up again automatically. Um, and then you can recreate your apps, sorry, your orgs, users and spaces using scripts, and then CI pipelines can just re-push all your apps. Uh, so that's great if you can get it to work, but it requires a tremendous amount of discipline. Um, not all teams have uh, that discipline, not all teams have pipelines, um, and Cloud Foundry is also a, a fun environment to play with. It's nice to just be able to push an app. Um, but if you do that without a corresponding pipeline to push it, then that app is just gone if the CF fails. Um, the time to recovery is very long. You have to stand up a CF and repush your apps, which necessitates recompiling them all. And if you use service instances, then you're out of luck. Uh, none of that data is backed up because they're on separate Bosch releases. Uh, there are some other themes, uh, other things people think about uh, when looking at backups. How do you manage artifacts? So how do you encrypt them at rest? How do you schedule backups? How do you uh, deal with retention? Presumably you want to expire all backups at some point because if your blob store is a terabyte, you don't want to be keeping that forever. Um, do I take partial backups? Do I take complete backups? Um, do I want to just incrementally back up everything that's changed since the last backup, or do I have to back up the whole thing? So we end up with a, a kind of a quite large problem space where we look at um, data consistency, how restore works, how we do encryption at rest, um, forwards and backwards compatibility, um, and it's really quite tricky. Uh, and Therese is going to talk about how we <coughs> solved it. Therese. Thanks, Henry. So we took all the things we learned when looking at other solutions for backup and restore, and we came up with a new model. So starting from the problem space, we divided the issues into two categories. One category, uh, how to orchestrate, includes all the concerns around the backup, things like encryption, scheduling, artifact management. Um, the other ca uh, category is how to do the actual backup and restore. So what data needs to be backed up, how, how is the data backed up, and what does a restore look like? So we've assigned these categories the role of orchestrator and component, and we've crafted a contract between them. So we end up with a backup and restore framework based on a contract that sets out the requirements for the orchestrator and the component. So now I'll talk through what the contract entails. The orchestrator expects the component to implement the hooks to do the backup and restore, lock, backup, unlock. Uh, the first requirement is for the orchestrator uh, to trigger those hooks in a prescribed order. So um, for a backup, lock, backup, unlock, and for a restore, lock, restore, unlock. The orchestrator is also responsible for moving the backup artifacts after a backup is taken um, and before restore. So the other side of the contract is the component. If a component wants to be backed up um, and restored, it has to implement the backup and restore hooks. And a component will implement the hooks that are appropriate to it. So if it doesn't need locking, it can just implement backup. Um, same for restore. Uh, and the, uh, when it takes a backup, it has to put the backup in a very particular place so that the orchestrator can find it. Um, and on a restore, take the artifacts from um, of the same place uh, in order to restore. Um, it, it's also possible to specify the order of locking. So if multiple components uh, implement locking, um, it can say this thing needs to be locked before this thing. Then that's optional. So here are all the things that are in the contract. So the contract separates the backup orchestration from the actual backup and restore logic. Um, and the backup and restore logic is written by the people who wrote the component. So these people understand how the data is stored, what a correct backup looks like, and what a correct restore looks like. Um, and because the backup logic is packaged with the component, uh, it doesn't get out of sync. So it's shipped with the component. And so the contract addresses the fragility and compatibility issues that Henry described earlier um, by encapsulating the, the backup and restore logic within the component. There are other benefits to the contract as well. So firstly, correctness. 
um, by asking a component to do its own backup, so say you're, you're Redis, right? Um, you, f you can flush things to disk and then create you know, a, a current backup with all of the data. Um, secondly, consistency. Because you have locking, because you can quiesce data changes while the, back while the backup is being taken across components, you can have the consistency that Henry talked about as being required between, for example, the, the database and the blob store. Also, backup and restore can be smart. So uh, it, can, it can choose to um, process the data before a backup is taken. It can choose to only backup some of the data. Um, you can do a lot of really clever things. And the other benefit of the way we've designed the contract is that the backup artifact is transferred after the lock unlock script is called, and so that minimizes the downtime, uh, you know, the, the, the time that API is unavailable. So now I'm going to talk about how we translated the um, contract into a real-world implementation, um, and that's Bosch Backup and Restore. So we call it BBR, Bosch Backup and Restore. Um, the orchestrator is the BBR binary, and the components are the Bosch jobs in a Bosch deployment. Um, so the unit of backup becomes a Bosch deployment, um, which makes a lot of sense because that's how operators think about the software that they deploy. So the BBR binary is a, a CLI. Uh, it runs on a jump box. Um, and it knows how to trigger backup and re restore hooks on both Bosch deployments and Bosch directors. So BBR backs up state, so it'll back up Elastic Runtime, um, and Cloud Foundry software. It can back up a Bosch director. Um, but when you do a restore, it's, it's like MySQL, where you have to stand up um, MySQL first and then put the data back in. So you stand up Cloud Foundry, and then you restore the data. So earlier, Henry showed you where state is stored in Cloud Foundry. Now I'm going to walk through what happens when an operator backs up Cloud Foundry using BBR. <clears throat> I'm only showing a few components here, um, but they sort of cover the range of implementations of the scripts. OK, so you trigger a backup. And then the first thing is all the lock scripts get called. In this case, uh, the cloud controller implements the lock script, and what that does is it stops requests uh, to the CF API. Next, BBR will call all the backup scripts in no particular order, um, which are implemented on the jobs in Cloud Foundry. So the cloud controller will generate backup artifacts for its data in the database, in CCDB, um, and for the blob store. So the Go router is an interesting case. Um, it only backs up one table. Um, and then Diego, because it, has, it, it's, it can regenerate its data, um, doesn't back up anything at all. So then BBR will call the unlock scripts. And in the unlock script, the Cloud Controller will restart the CF API. And then finally, BBR will copy the backup artifacts back to the VM where the BBR binary was triggered, uh, typically a jump box. And then your backup is finished. OK, so I'm going to show you a, a demo, but it's, um, it's a video. I sped it up, and also I have really bad luck with live demos. Uh, this, is what, this is backing up um, Elastic Runtime, which is Pivotal's Cloud Foundry. So um, in this case, we're using the Ops Manager VM as a jump box because it, it has access to the um, ERT network. Um, so we've passed in the Bosch director IP and the, uh, and the login and the name, the Bosch name of the deployment. Um, you can see that BBR outputs quite a lot of useful information, like every, what it's doing at every step. Um, and then you can also see that the artifact gets copied after uh, the unlock scripts are called. Um, and then after the backup is taken, BBR checksums each of the artifacts and creates a metadata file with a list of artifacts and checksums and the time that the backup um, was started and finished. So 
BBO will only work with Bosch releases that have implemented the backup and restore scripts. Um, and here are the releases that currently do, um, have implemented those scripts. So the Bosch Director, CredHub, UAA, Elastic Runtime. And the work I talked about where, um, so rooting is backing up the ta its own table and CCDB is backing up another table. That work is in progress and when that's done, um, BBR will work against Open Source Cloud Foundry. Uh, we're also working on BBR support for data services. So BBR, I mean, Henry talked about the different concerns around backup and restore. BBR is, this, is I think of as a small, small sharp tool, right? It's the very kernel of how to take a correct backup and restore. There's a much bigger ecosystem with um, many other problems to solve. So Shield has written an integration um, or Stark and Wayne has written an integration for Shield. Um, and then I have, uh, really excitingly, Dell EMC has, um, is uh, announcing a white paper today where they have uh, done a POC where BoostFS is mounted into the jump box so that the backup artifact gets written directly to a data domain appliance. Um, and there's several benefits to this. One is it's a kind of more secure, straightforward workflow for moving backup artifacts to long-term storage. Um, also, data domain dedupes the artifacts, and so you have a really powerful reduction in the amount of data storage required. Um, there, the white paper is that URL, um, and we have Jessica here from Dell EMC, um, and she would love to talk to you after, you wanna stand up? <laughs> Thanks. Um, she would love to talk to anybody about this after, um, after the talk. So going forward, uh, we'll be looking at how we need to extend the BBR contract to handle different circumstances. So um, to handle ex external data stores, for example, um, one really tricky problem we're trying to solve right now is how to back up, um, how to validate backup artifacts without running a full restore. Full restores are really expensive, kind of risky. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's something we're focused on. Um, we may extend the contract to support partial backup and restore, incremental backup and restore. There's like, there are, you know, it's not a static contract. Um, and then BBR itself, we're looking at, so at the moment we use Bosch SSH to drive the contract. Uh, we're looking at using a Bosch agent, for example, um, or the new Aaron's uh, uh, functionality that's new in Bosch. Um, we're also looking at optimizations like calling all the backup scripts in parallel instead of serially. And um, we're also, so we're currently working on writing scripts to um, ex uh, support external blob stores and also external data stores, um, databases, uh, and data services. So going forward, uh, it, it's, it's good to think about how to make Cloud Foundry itself more backupable. Uh, so I know that some of the teams writing um, backup scripts are Create, are uh, implementing a read-only mode instead of making their API completely unavailable. Um, minimizing data references between data stores, so there's less kind of fragility, less consistency required. And also thinking about storing data in Cloud Foundry in a different way. So storing data as a sort of series of actions that can be replayed instead of kind of having a snapshot of, of state to, re, to recreate the world. So we've talked about what it means to back up and restore Cloud Foundry, um, how people are solving that problem today, what the contract that we've come up with to, to solve the, the how do you back up a distributed system problem, um, our particular implementation of it, which, it, which is Bosch Backup and Restore, uh, and what we're looking at for the future. So we have, um, we're part of uh, the open source extensions uh, incubator. Um, so all of our, uh, our repos are public 
um, and we're in Slack, and we're, we're super friendly, so come say hello. Um, so thank you for listening, and we've got some, a little bit of time for questions. Yeah, yeah many times. Many times. Many times. It's not a sentence, so let's move on from that. Yes. Oh, oh, all right. Can we clap? That was awesome. <laughs> yeah. Come down here. Yeah, um, I understand the requirement for locking the database before uh, backing uh, it up, uh, but uh, what about in a production environment? I mean, I cannot stop my environment for more than a few minutes. And usually a backup uh, can take uh, even a long time if uh, it's a large environment. Mm -hmm. So to be clear, what gets locked is the CF API. It's not, so it doesn't, it's not downtime for your app. It's downtime from pushing new bits. Yeah, 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 right. But uh, it means that uh, no one can uh, trigger stats uh, for uh, CF, uh, requiring information for uh, the status of the application. Uh, anyone can push a new application or a uh, stage or mm -hmm. whatever it is. That's true, that's true. We have, um, certainly for the internal, internal blob store backup, we, uh, rather than uh, taking a full copy of the blob store, we use hard links on the, the blob store machine. So we can create some hard links, unlock the cloud controller as soon as the MySQL backup is done, which only takes a minute or two, and then so out, of, out of band, download all of those blobs. So that, that minimizes the downtime. We've, um, seen, yeah, we've seen downtime of less than 10 minutes for very, very large blob stores. Um, and the strategy we're pursuing for backing up external blob stores is actually very similar, where we're, we're just taking references to the blobs while the lock is held for consistency and then doing any sort of copying afterward. And one more question is, uh, how often uh, do you, in your experience, uh, what's the frequency of the backup, the right frequency? So the, that is something that is dependent on how much data you're comfortable losing. So if your app developers are pushing, you know, a thousand times a day, then you're going to want to take really frequent backups so that you don't lose, you know. But if your app developers are only pushing once a day, then you can back up less frequently. I mean, I, th I think a starting point is every day, but, you know, it, that is a decision that needs to be taken by the operator. Okay, thank you. Um, is there a plan to um, offer the backup and restore features to um, the app developers via the, the CLI tool? That's a really good question. So you can backup yeah. before you see if push new code, which yep. degrades data structures, and if it fails, you can restore. Yeah, so the service broker API has a way, has a backup and restore primitive. Um, and because, so for example, with on-demand uh, services that, pivot, like, that are offered via Pivotal, um, the unit of a service instance is a Bosch deployment. So if you, you know, if you run BBR against that Bosch deployment, then you effectively get the backup that ties to your app. Does that make sense? Ex exposing this to the to Cloud Foundry is probably out of scope. Like, we need someone to talk about it, <laughs> but it is it is Bosch Bosch backup and restore. Sure. Is, <laughs> there, there. Uh, I guess this. I'm just saying here, like it's not your fault. Like, the, the, the short <laughs> answer is that there is. Um, it's in the roadmap. Yes. I, I would love it for backup and restore to be exposed to users. Uh, I think there was mention of something with the the contract and the locking that there was an an order that could be specified or something like that. Mm -hmm. So is that something that is is not yet used or or is it actually being used somehow in, in the backups now? And and I uh, overlooked it because I was I was curious about that. Yeah, it is, it is in use at the moment. Um, so depending on what you're backing up, you might want to have certain components locked first. So a good example is if uh, you uh, care about backing up a particular um, a, a database that's changed by a CF app, then you might care that the app is stopped before the cloud controller is taken down 
after which you can't make any changes to app state. Um, so that's one, that's one case where we're using it. I'm not sure there are any others. No, that's, that is the one that's, at the moment. That's, that's yeah. the case for that. Yeah. But, but I mean, in essence, it's, it's arbitrary. So you can say, I want this boss release is lock scripts to be called before this boss release is lock scripts. Um, Thank you. Oh, thank you.